Good morning, Reunion family. Happy Sunday. My name is Will, and I'm going to share a few announcements with you before we get into scripture and our teaching. If this is your first time here, let me be the first to just say welcome. We're so happy that you're here. It's an honor and a privilege to host you in this virtual space. So our call to worship today comes from 1 Chronicles 29, 10 through 13, which says, Praise be to you, Lord, the God of our father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. So let's pray and I'll tell you what's coming up with Reunion. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your presence and your purpose this morning. Lord, would you just tune our ears in to what you have to say this morning? Lord, give us your love, your mercy, your spirit. We thank you and we love you. Amen. So I have two really quick announcements to say this morning before Russ will get to the teaching and before that I'll also read the scripture. Um, the first is about our connection card. So we would love to hear from you. The connection card is essentially a way for us to let you know what's going on in the church. So if you have questions about our community, if you want to sign up for our mailing list, or really importantly, if you need prayer, sign up at that link below um, and we'll get you hooked up. The second and more important announcement is about our Justice Centers coming up. Many of you have probably heard about these. There are going to be three Justice Centers that we as a church are hosting um, alongside a catering company here in New York City. They'll be this week, three nights. You get to choose whichever one works best for you. It's going to be Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, which is June 15th, 16th, and 17th. And each dinner will be from 7 to 9 p.m. So with these dinners, we're really honored to partner with Just Soul Catering, which is a catering company here in New York City that hires formerly incarcerated individuals. Um, and we're just so excited to partner with this chef. Um, these evenings will include incredible food, but also a chance to hear personal stories, to partake in conversations around justice and mass incarceration, and also ways that you can get involved. Um, so please join us and bring a friend. It's open to everyone. Tuesdays and Wednesdays dinners will be in Chelsea and Thursdays will be in Williamsburg. And we will email you the exact location once you sign up. And that sign up is in the links below this video. Um, we really, really, really hope you join us. We're so excited. Bring a friend, bring multiple friends. I think there are still some spots left. So please, please sign up for whatever night works best for you. Um, all the links for everything I just talked about, the connection card and the dinners is below. Definitely let us know if you have any questions, check those links out. Um, yeah, that's about all I have. So with all that said, let's prepare our hearts to receive our scripture reading for today. And today's comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 11 through 24. So hear this. For this is the message you heard from the beginning. We should love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own actions were evil and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised, my brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love each other. Anyone who does not love remains in death. Anyone who hates a brother or sister is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life residing in him. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. This is how we know that we belong to the truth 
and how we set our hearts at rest in his presence. If our hearts condemn us, we know that God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. Dear friends, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have confidence before God and receive from him anything we ask because we keep his commands and do what pleases him. And this is his command, to believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as he commanded us. The one who keeps God's commands lives in him and he in them. And this is how we know that he lives in us. We know it by the spirit he gave us. This is the word of the Lord. Hey, thank you so much for uh, joining us uh, here in our online space. We're going to be here the second and fourth uh, Sundays uh, through the summer as we make plans um, to gather in person uh, in the fall. And uh, what I want to do today is I really want to preach the announcements, uh, so to speak. Uh, Will uh, gave us some information about the justice dinners. And what I want to do is sort of give us the why. Why um, gather around the table um, in that way why we're doing this as a community and our community groups have been in the first uh, in the book of first John and I really want to jump out of this space to talk about and give us a vision for why we should uh, do that and we'll, we'll really land practically so let me pray as we begin and so God I love you and um, I just pray that e even though um, there are barriers clearly in um, gathering in this way I, I pray that you would uh, by your spirit speak to us and I know for myself, I, I need prayers right now that um, my words would be um, from you, uh, that they, um, that you'd give me clarity and that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart would be pleasing to you. I need your help, God. It's in your name we pray. Amen. And so I recently found uh, my wife's old iPod and uh, she's fancy, she um, has an iPod video and it's not like, you know, 10, 15 gigs, but it's like a thick iPod video, like 120 gigs. This thing holds like 100, uh, it holds like 30,000 songs or whatever. Um, I found a, a pair of uh, old uh, over the ear headphones, like with the, the plug-in jack, like still works. Um, and multiple nights over the last few weeks, I've laid in bed and just, listen to her iPod, just get lost in some of the oldies on there, uh, Death Cab, The Fray, uh, Laura Marling, and uh, just laying in bed like this took me back to like ninth grade um, where I would take my uh, headphones out. I had this, uh, this uh, headphones, it was like a swirl headphones. It was like a 12 foot cord. I would plug it into this old receiver that my dad gave me, five disc changer, and I would just walk around the room or just like lay on this old bean bag uh, in my room and just listen to music um, with uh, my eyes closed. And doing this is like in, sup, in such sharp contrast to how we listen to music today, you know, headphones in, different apps open, social media scrolling. Um, but when I do this, I'm not trying to be in a million places at once, but you know, when we listen to music like the old way, it's like you're only there, right? Just sitting, far more focused. You're catching um, lyrics. You're more in tune with the vibe and the flow. And you don't just um, listen, but you really hear, right? Not just passively, but actively hearing. And if I could just bridge this uh, metaphor um, with people, to really hear in this way is to love. To be attuned to people in this way is to love. Uh, David Augsburger writes, being heard is so close to being loved that for the average person, they are almost indistinguishable. And this is our agenda for today is love. This is the vision the author of 1 John um, wants to put on display. Now, if you've never read the book of 1 John, it's absolutely amazing. Um, if you read it straight through, you, you, you might find that it's a bit scattered. There's not like a clear logical flow to the whole thing, but rather it's sort of repetitive or you're, um, the author is trying to cycle around different ideas in different ways. Or you know, if you're a bit mystical or, or spiritual, you might say, well, I love this. There's these seemingly vague but positive vibes um, and then you grasp some of John's intensity in writing this, uh, the stark 
contrasts based on these simple ideas, light and darkness, evil and good, hate and love. But ultimately, that is what John has in mind, is love. And John is not vague if you take in the book as a whole about this idea of love. He simply states, God is love. And love comes from God. And I know that sounds like, wow, that's like mind-blowing. That's big. That's, a, that's, a, that, that's something that could easily permeate the whole Bible, right? That God is love. But then he moves further, right? God is the source of love. But then he goes on to speak to the fact that Jesus is the embodiment of God's love. And so if you wanna know how to love, you look at the life and the person of Jesus. But then he takes it even a step further, and this will be our focus for today, is to love God is to actually love other people. To love God is actually to love other people. And here's how John's admonition begins for us today. In verse 11, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And hopefully you're with me there. You're like, all right, like regardless of what you believe, that's great love. Hopefully hopefully you're hanging in. But then it gets a little bit uh, tougher here. Verse 12, we should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And so clearly, uh, there's a very intense logic here. And I'm just guessing if you're watching this today that uh, you've never murdered anyone or you don't have any plans to murder anyone. Um, but really what the author is doing is he's pulling us into a sort of logic about the dichotomy between love and hate. And what he's saying is, is in our culture, it's actually quite easy, right? To point out the fact that we are good quality people, right? Right? Well, look at them, right? I'm a good person if you compare me to them. I do the right things. I make the right choices. When I go to Whole Foods and I'm in the self-checkout line, I pay for my bags instead of lying and saying I'm not taking theirs. But they, right? What they do is worse than me. I only hate people quietly, but they murder people. And so what the writer is actually doing is he's saying, well, if there's hate in you, you're actually abiding in death. And what we have here is a really profound logic about love, that there's a litmus test to show if you have life or you have death, and the litmus test is love. Uh, When I was 17, I used to clean pools. I was a pool boy. And um, pools are are sort of about, and cleaning pools is sort of about, um, you know, getting the debris out of the pool, sweeping down the sides, um, you know, cleaning the filters. Some, some of that is a way to clean the pools, but the primary way to clean a pool is through the chemicals. And in order to, to know what chemicals you need or to test, the litmus test you need um, is uh, like a, a little test tube and strips. And you take this litmus test and you test for the hardness of water. You test chlorine levels, um, pH levels, um, the acidity. And so you take that test strip, you, you know, dip it in the pool, and then you take it next to um, the chart that's on the tube. And you know after that, if do you need to add acid or uh, chlorine or new water? It's a litmus test. And this is what the writer is saying here is that there's a gauge or litmus test and it's actually love. Verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. And so the litmus test to show if you have life or if you have death is in your love. John, uh, Jesus says something different, uh, something similar in uh, John chapter 13, verse 35. He says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. See, it's, it's quite easy um, to say, okay, well, that's actually great, Russell. Like, I actually needed this reminder that I need to be more loving. The, the, this command to love, but there's a, a couple problems here. Is one that is very vague, right? And because it's vague, it's probably like I'm going to walk away from here and be like, ah, yeah. There's a couple things that I could do to be a more loving person, right? I could, I probably, you know, need to have that conversation or I need to talk to that person. That's, that's great, right? 
But number two, John's message and the, the, the gospel message, if you take it in the entirety of the Bible, gets lost if you take it to mean only a moral or ethical principle for you to walk away from. Rather, the writer is saying the, the way that you love is actually a litmus test for how it is that you understand the love of God. Now, does that mean you're going to walk away from here and, and, and you're going to get this all right if you understand the love of God? Not, not necessarily. You, you know, we're, we're humans. We, we mess up. But the horizontal relationship that we have with others, um, with our significant others, with our friends, with our community, with our parents, all of that is a, a sign, it's a window, it's a picture, it's a litmus test for how it is that we understand and perceive the love of God. In fact, I don't think it's a stretch to say that the way in which we love others, out of that comes, it, uh, that comes out of how we know and understand the love of God. And the reason I say that is because we naturally make enemies rather than friends. And you might say, well, why don't, enemies is a strong word. Why don't you just say we make strangers or we perceive other people as other? And the reason is, is because other is a category outside of ourselves and we are naturally skeptical of other people. And so imagine you meet somebody um, when you're on the train one day naturally they are not your friend and so maybe you get on the train and they're kind of smiling at you and um, they look at you and you're like i please you know stop stop looking at me you know <laughs> like uh, no and what if they look at you and they say how are you doing uh <laughs> you're like i i'm 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 fine and in your mind you're thinking please go away right that's like the first thing that you're thinking and what's going on in you right you're naturally skeptical about that person and their motives. Naturally, we create enemies rather than friends. I love how Henry Nouwen says it. He says, enemies are enemies by the way that we exclude them from the love of God. When we love with God's love, we can no longer divide people into those who deserve God's love and those who don't. When we come to know God's first, God's first love, nobody can be excluded from that love. And so as we are internalizing the love of God, it's flowing out of us into others, breaking down barriers where we can become natural friends rather than natural enemies. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. Um, preached a sermon called Loving Your Enemies in Montgomery, Alabama in 1957. He said this, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. We never get rid of an enemy by meeting hate with hate. We get rid of an enemy by getting rid of enmity. By its very nature, hate destroys and tears down. By its very nature, love creates and builds up. Love transforms with redemptive power. And so maybe we should pause there and um, I'll allow you some space to just think practically, quickly. What, you, you, you know what that's like when hate is growing within you toward a friend um, toward a parent, toward a sibling, like you know what happens when hate dwells in, within you, right? Forgive, unforgiveness is like boiling up. You're like, I know that I need to do that, but I'm so angry, I'm so frustrated at that person. And it's, it comes, right? We, we, when we try to meet hate with hate, but rather Martin Luther King Jr. says, love creates and builds up. And we know, right? We, we know what the intensity uh, of emotion um, that, that that feeling is. And what the writer is trying to say is if we're not, if we're not loving, we're, li we're living in, or, or his word is abiding in death. And John speaks frequently about this idea of sin in his book. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, he says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, and I think that really helps illuminate what's, what's happening when we're abiding in death is that sin is, is, is within us. Uh, Martin Luther, the, the 16th century reformer now, not the civil rights leader, um, had, a, had a fascinating way of describing sin. Um, sin is uh, traditionally thought to be um, you know, breaking God's law. And it, and it definitely means this as you read uh, the Bible, but Martin Luther was expanding on this idea of, of, of sin as a life turned inwardly on itself. In the Latin, it's in curvatus in se. It's a life turned or curved inwardly towards itself rather than outwardly um, for God and for uh, towards others. And I think this is a really helpful um, in, in our culture of hyper individualism. It is, um, 
it, it's showing the cracks in our progressivism, right? The, the, a life turned inward feels the isolation. It feels the depression and the anxiety uh, and the apathy and the narcissism and the addiction. And here's how Martin Luther described that life turn inwardly. He said, our nature, by the corruption of the first sin being so deeply curved in on itself, in curvatus in se, that is, that, that it not only bends the best gift of God's toward itself and enjoys them, as in plain in the works righteousness and hypocrites, or rather even uses God himself in order to attain these gifts, but it also fails to realize that it is so wickedly, curvedly, and viciously seeks all things, even God, for its own sake, right? Turned inwardly, even the good things of God turned inwardly for the self, right? Selfishness, pride, self-centeredness, the, uh, a life lived inwardly. Here's a picture uh, from the New Yorker in 2015. I think this is a fantastic image of what we're talking about here. You have a picture of a person, a body curved in on itself. And the shape of this person is um, protecting and defending itself, missing the outside world, right? There's a butterfly above his head and he's just missing it. There's an inability to see outside of the self and he's hiding. And I, I, I see this, I be, it's, it's interesting, there's actually a, a word for people who have um, text neck, right? It's pain in your neck from um, looking down, being consumed with the self, keeping other things and other people at arm's length, right? Judgment, keep it at arm's length. The change, help, love, God, keep those things at arm's length. But as we turn inwardly, our world gets smaller and darker, and I think in many ways, the, the onset of the pandemic brought about this type of inward turn for a lot of us. I can say for myself, right? Protect, keep yourself safe. But then what happens over time is if we continue to live in that inward turn towards ourself, not outwardly in love towards others, what we actually find is the, that we're trapped. We're enslaved by our own feelings, by our own desires. Right, that's what verse 14 is saying. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. That's the trajectory of a life lived inwardly though is death, but a life turned out is love. Inwardly, what happens when, when we, when we um, are turned inward, anything from the outside is perceived as a threat or an enemy, right? We can't see outside of ourselves. We're gonna naturally perceive something coming from the outside as an enemy. Henry Nouwen writes, the enemy remains the enemy only as long as we have not yet fully seen the love of God. Feelings of hatred, these are like uh, uh, symptoms of this. And so if you have symptoms of this, maybe this is a life turned inward. Feelings of hatred, rejection, jealousy, resentment enslave us in our self-made prison of fear. We become the victims of our self-made enemy, but every time we're able to forgive and no longer define ourselves over and against the other, we enter the house of God, which is the house of love. Love of enemies becomes the way of knowing God is the God of the first love. Love is the answer, right? It sounds pretty simple. It sounds pretty um, straightforward. Love your brother. But it's hard, it's difficult, or nearly impossible for us because naturally we have a bent towards ourself, a life curved inwardly on itself. So how do we do this? How do we love our brother in this moment? How, do we, how are we drawn outside of ourselves? Verse 16, by this we know love, that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. And so what you have here in verse 16 is sort of this gospel moment. The, the writer is drawing again on the love of God. Do you understand what God has done for you in Christ? Right? Do you understand uh, that Jesus lived a perfect life, died a perfect death, rose triumphantly from the grave? The ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate act of love. God is love because of what he's done in Jesus. And as we're understanding that, right, when we understand that he laid down his life for us, what happens? We lay down our life for our friends. Uh, my daughter loves to go to the park and they, they turn the water features on a couple weeks ago at the playground. And um, there's this wheel 
and it has like these um, cone shaped buckets on the wheel and uh, the water feature turns on the spout begins to pour in water and as that bucket fills up it turns and dumps and it spins and it another cone catches the water fills up and it just continues to turn and to dump water and i just sort of get this picture here of overflow do you understand um, that Jesus laid down his life for you? Okay, well, a- as you do, your bucket is getting filled up and it's just overflowing onto others. And as that happens, here's what, what John says. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. And so the big idea is like, hey, we ought to lay down our life for our friends. But like, then, then John begins to get a little bit practical. Well, how, how are you going to lay down your life for your friends if you don't simply see your brother in need, right? See, and I, this word see here. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees, the word see there is not just to see, but um, to discern and to experience. And so if we're going to actually um, be able to embody this command, we actually need to wake up. And we need to pay attention. Uh, Alexandra Horowitz uh, writes a book called On Looking. It's a walker's guide to the art of observation. And in it, she poetically captures um, what we miss when we walk our neighborhoods. Uh, she takes 11 different walks around New York City um, and she gathers other people's unique experience about what they see and what they observe in their prospective neighborhood. And she has this ability to intentionally see um, what others see when they, when they walk and to wake up, to pay attention to what's around us. It was a, when I was thinking about this and I read this book, it's like this, I have this perpetual av- aversion um, to paying attention. And what she begins to speak to in the book is um, when, we, when we walk our neighborhoods, we actually over time lose a sense of expectation. So we actually are unable to see because we've lost the mystery. And she says this in her book, Part of what restricts us seeing things is that we have an expectation about what we will see. And we actually perceptually restricted by that expectation. In a sense, expectation is the lost cousin of attention. Both serve to reduce what we need to process of the world out there. Attention is the more charismatic member, packaged and sold more effectively, but expectation is also a crucial part of what we see. Together, they allow us to be functional, reducing the sensory chaos of the world into unbothersome and understandable units. And so if we're going to see, if we're going to see, then we actually need a sense of expectation and a sense of anticipation. And so hopefully um, you're, you're with me on this journey. You're, you're seeing where I'm kind of headed about this idea of what love means what it looks like to embody it we're seeing a life turned inward but how is it that we accept the love of god and it opens us up to others right we're catching the heartbeat for genuine love and that's what verse 18 is all about little children let us not love in word or talk don't talk about it but in deed and in truth and so how how are we doing this or what's the plan to love and I told you before, we're you know, trying to preach the announcements today, which is um, these justice dinners. Um, and you may be thinking, why, why start here? Why come to the table? And hopefully, like in this post-COVID, I, I, you know, I'm like anticipating we're, we're, we're in the right direction. Right? I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. But um, why, why is this sort of the, the, the first step? And the reason is, is, as I've been examining and thinking about the life and the person of Jesus, Jesus' ministry wasn't magic. In fact, it was a a fairly practical journey that began with eating. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, regularly show people eating with Jesus. Uh, Luke chapter 7, verse 34, it says, The Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, Look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Well, Why why is Jesus at the table with, with these people, right? Jesus ate with strangers and outcasts as a, as a consistent way of demonstrating that table fellowship was to, was to nurture others and not just for simply um, self-enhancement. Uh, Jesus ate with strangers and outcasts to reject a social system of hierarchy and exclusion by welcoming everyone into communion with him. 
Jesus ate with strangers and outcasts to enact grace in community. He ate with strangers and outcasts to create a space to listen and to pay attention and to meet needs. One commentator I read this week said, Jesus got himself killed because of the way that he ate. Not because he ate with his mouth open, but he ate with his arms open to those who would have never been invited. And this is the motivation. This is the love piece, like uh, extended outwardly. This is why we want to gather around the table. And this is a, a, a spiritual exercise. This is a spiritual practice. This is what Norman Wiersbe writes in his book, Food and Faith. And this is just fun, a fun book about food and eating. He says, it is helpful to characterize eating as a spiritual exercise. The purpose of people who gather around a table to eat is not simply to shovel nutrients into their body. Eating together should be an occasion in which people learn to become more attentive and present to the world and each other. Because eating is something we regularly do, it can be the training ground where people learn to articulate their fears and worries, but also name the many sources of nurture and help that are evident at the table. With the help of each other, we can practice the skills of conversation, reflection, and gratitude that contribute to a, a more completely human life. Eating with each other, we discover the world and learn to evaluate and respond to it. We begin to see that we are part of a community of life that requires us to be responsible members within it. And so we want to do these justice dinners to create a free space where we can come and we can naturally be friends rather than enemies, even with those unlike us. We want to come together to bring our presence, right? Not to be bent inwardly, but to be open to what God is doing, right? To, to, to tear down walls of division, to sit with those unlike us, and to learn to listen. And by that, we might learn to love one another. And so um, let me tell you uh, our invitation before I pray. Uh, our justice dinners, uh, Will talked about it, um, each evening, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday this week, 7 to 9 p.m., Tuesday and Wednesday in Chelsea, uh, Thursday night in uh, Williamsburg. The food is going to be free. Um, but we're working with different organizations that uh, we will explain and invite you into um, make a donation uh, that evening. But everything is going to be completely optional and anonymous. And so all are welcome. So you can please uh, feel free to um, join us and invite a friend. If you have any questions about this, uh, you can uh, email us at info at reunionnyc.com or you can fill out that connection card below. And so hopefully today you got a picture and a vision of what that looks like. Uh, let me pray before I wrap us up. And so Father, uh, I love you and um, I, pr I pray for this week for these dinners that as we um, gather around the table that you would be in our midst, um, that we would push through the ways in which um, there's tension or awkwardness or walls are, are put up but that uh, we would feel free to just come and to be ourselves, um, to listen, to hear about um, ways and matters of justice that are um, beyond us at times, but to, to really come and to share our experience in a way that is real and that's authentic. And I just pray that um, if your spirit is nudging us or responding us to do something today, that you would invite us into knowing what that is, um, a phone call, um, a way of, of listening or experiencing others. Um, maybe it's a, a way that we've been inward and we need to be open. I just pray that we um, would be responding to you now by your spirit. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, thank you so much um, for uh, being with us. The links for everything that we talked about today, the signups for the Justice Dinners are below. There's also a link below to uh, give generously. If you call Reunion uh, your home um, and you want to give back to what God is doing through our community in the city, you can do that, reunionnyc.com backslash um, give. And what we want to do uh, when we gather too is uh, we want to give the why behind why we do these things. And so we have a giving liturgy. So I'm going to read this. Um, if you want to read it, I don't know where you are, but um, you could read this too. And it simply says this, Father, you are an abundant giver. There is nothing I have that you have not given me. All I have and am belong to you. Help me to honor you with my resources. Free me from the deceit of riches. Lead me on the path of generosity. All that I have is yours. All that I have is you. Use our gifts for works of love and mercy and to the increase of your glory. Amen.
And of course, if you're just visiting us, please feel no compulsion to give. Um, if you'd like to reach out to say hello, you can fill out our uh, Connect card that's below. Let me send you with a blessing. And so, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May, you, may he give us the ability to love, not just in word, but in deed. May the Holy Spirit fill our cup so that we may overflow unto others. And may we be sent out to eat, dine, and see others that we may really hear and listen and learn. Amen.